Hello, uh, I'm Dara Emilie, I'm curator at ZKM. So uh, we got a signal from our event team that we can start the live stream. <laughs> Uh, I'm super delighted to welcome you to this last uh, edition of the Terrestrial University and to welcome you here on site in the media theater of the ZKM, but also, of course, our online public, uh, online audience and also our guests. Um, and we will have today two guests here in the media theater, Yvonne Volkert and Raza Smita, and uh, Arthur Gessler and uh, Kaisa Rizanen will join us online via Zoom. Um, so, uh, today's topic is uh, visualizing uh, forest ecosystem and we will discuss how the climate change affects forest ecosystems, why forest is fragrant and how art and science can together make us in different ways more sensible towards these dynamic processes that are happening in the forest. I would like to introduce to you our wonderful guests. Um, Next to me is Yvonne Volkert. Uh, Yvonne, you are the principal investigator of the research project Ecodata, Ecomedia, Ecoaesthetics. The project deals with the role of new media uh, and technology in the arts and the perception and awareness of the ecological. Um, also, you are responsible for the research development at the Institute Art, Gender and Nature at the Academy of Art and Design in Basel. Also quite uh, unusual uh, institute, I would say, and uh, very uh, cool. Your monograph, uh, Technologies of Care, uh, Techno Eco Feminist Readings of Art and Science, will appear at uh, Diophanes next year. Your concerns lies, lie in the modes how aesthetic theory practice, ecology, technology, science, and decolon uh, decolonial feminism come together and bring us in relation to the world. Raza, very nice to meet you again also in person <laughs> after one year and a half uh, of um, yeah, no, no, not traveling and uh, social distancing. Um, uh, I would like to introduce you shortly. You are an artist and researcher working on the age uh, of art, science and emerging technologies. You have co-founded RIGS, Center for New Media Culture in Riga. And uh, I also co-curator there of uh, festivals and uh, art and science festivals. Raza also holds a PhD with the topic Creative Networks and lectures on networked media and art science, technoecologies and sonic immersions and uh, artistic re research methodologies at different universities, also here at the HFG, but also, for example, uh, at uh, ACT uh, at MIT in Boston. In her artistic practice, Raza Smita works together with Raiti Smits and uh, creates uh, networked techno-ecological artworks. Now I would like to present and introduce our uh, speakers online. Uh, today, uh, Arthur Gessler will join us and uh, Arthur is director of the long-term forest ecosystem research and group leader forest growth at the Swiss Federal Institute for Forest, Snow and Landscape Research. Uh, abbreviation is VSL, so I think it's <laughs> better to use the abbreviation. Um, your research, uh, Arthur, is geared towards understanding the processes that drive and regulate biogeochemical cycles, biotic interactions and biodiversity ecosystem functioning at different scales. And uh, today also uh, Kaiza Rizanian will join uh, via Zoom and uh, Kaiza is, is researcher with a background in forest sciences and ecosystem atmosphere interactions. She holds a PhD uh, and um, it's focused on the interplay between tree uh, physiology, tree defense and the emissions of volatile organic compounds. <clears throat> As a part of uh, this research, um, Kaiza collaborated with the VSL and uh, currently she is a postdoc uh, researcher at Univers Université de Québec uh, à Montréal in Canada. Uh, her broader interests are related to tree physiology, how trees work, how the environment affects their functions and how their functions affect their environment. Uh, the event uh, will be accompanied by our Critical Zones Telegram group uh, and our online public is very welcome uh, to um, um, write questions and uh, commentaries uh, in the Telegram group and we will try to bring uh, them also into our discussion. Uh, to remind you, our Telegram group is ZKM underscore critical zones. Uh, as for the program of today's evening, uh, all the participants will start um, with uh, short contributions and after that we will have uh, some time also for the discussion and Q&A from the public. 
uh, now I would like to pass the word uh, to Yvonne Folkert for a brief introduction. So Yvonne, the floor is yours. You're very welcome. Thank you, Daria. I'm very happy that I can present here our research project. Um, and um, it ended last spring. And um, atmospheric forest, which we will talk about today, is part of this eco Ecodata, Ecomedia, Eco Aesthetics project. The idea was that three artists develop uh, a known individual approach to um, a forest in South Switzerland, to the so-called Fienwald, of which we will hear more later. We did so in very close collaboration with the WSL and um, Kaisa, uh, yeah, she was there as a postdoc uh, student and is now back in Finland after being in Montreal. <laughs> so, um, yes. Um, the starting point of this project was an exhibition I did with my colleagues Sabine Himmelsbach and Karin Ohlenschläger um, almost 15 years ago, and it was called Ecomedia. And with Ecomedia, we meant um, hybrid conjunctions of um, a, between registering and sending media technologies and the material world. We can see it here in this photo. It shows um, a situation in the Fienwald in which sensors are measuring um, the, the sap flow of a, of a pine. And um, this, this um, conjunction we found interesting at that time. And we thought it's really interesting how new media and new technologies intervene and become mediators between the worlds. And in the meantime, in these 15 years, uh, we can say that really a lot um, this tendency or this hype, <laughs> I say, towards this kind of thought technologies really increased. Today, for most people, it is more real to see uh, or to watch or to hear an earthworm than, having, than holding it in the hand. So uh, I think we can really uh, see how uh, time changed and that, uh, and that the sensing of, of sensing technologies is, yeah, that's the question. Is it a sensing, something uh, which we uh, relate to uh, natural environments, or uh, is it something that is mediated? And I think this, um, this sit in this situation, um, I wanted to explore with this project. And um, yeah, and uh, two ideas were there. Uh, I write the current hype, but also hope of these uh, ecomedia or sensing technologies as media of delivering facts by measuring the situation. That's very important that we always, with sensing technologies, we always have um, um, a mathematical approach, always a, a measure situation. And the idea is that this, um, um, situation enhances and affects our perception, human perception, into the more than human realms. So um, Brian Holmes' quotation was also very uh, important for me because um, he uh, articula articulates this hope of this <laughs> uh, technic hype. So, um, and and um, yeah, I want to read it. Satellites are to ecological activism what cell phone cameras are to Black Lives Matter. When the cool abstract data of the environmental sciences are adopted and expressed by impassionate individuals and groups, you get the climate justice movement. Spanning the globe with its powerful proxies, the climate movement turns data into knowledge then it turns knowledge into aesthetic forms, and finally it turns aesthetic forms into action. So it's 
important that for him, uh, this uh, eco-media are only media to uh, social change. And um, but for him and also for us uh, is very important is uh, more than uh, the technologies, is it's more the aesthetic techniques which are used or the aesthetics. So, um, yeah, the, the visionary and moving quality of artistic projects lies not in the adoption of innovative technologies of monitoring the environment or in addressing exploitative relationships in terms of content, but in producing an experience of aesthetic surplus and joy. This was something like the, the working thesis to us. Uh, and that means in generating an event of unexpected aesthetic relations and experiences with our co-beings and in triggering effects of caring about and of caring for the others, of mothering um, for the more than human. So in the process, so uh, here we then landed in the Pienwald, thanks to Markus Matter, who already did research there before and who could establish um, the connection. So. This uh, research platform is a unique site uh, globally and it monitors and experiments with irrigation and it, in a certain sense it tries to, um, we will hear that, uh, it tries to, um, to foresee um, conditions of forests under climate heating. The forest looks like a patient in intensive care uh, there in this laboratory. And it, it was very interesting today when I saw the exhibition here, Critical Zones, that this situation which we found there is exactly the starting point of Critical Zones. It's also this idea of, uh, of this kind of eco-media delivering data and of, of this constant surveillance which delivers data about uh, the critical situation of the patient. The patient here is not the whole earth or the critical zone, but the forest uh, or sometimes also single trees. But the situation is, is um, scary and intimidating. And this is, um, and measuring life means caring for life, which is troubling, and vice versa. Um, so the idea or the, the different um, significations of the term care became also very uh, important. Care in German means Sorge, uh, la cura, curator in, in Latin. And there are uh, different, very contradictory significations like a uh, trouble, something troubles me, the forest troubles me, then it's also concern, it's also I tend uh, something or I try to heal uh, somebody or something and there's also the idea of longing. Um, but what is also very important to, to us is uh, the kind of definition which Lori Grün uh, gives. She says, care focuses on relationships and the ways in which relationships can be better or worse. Care ethics is often thought to be just about caring for someone, but it is essentially a relational aesthetics. Uh, ethics, sorry. So this relationality uh, became very important. And also this situation here, we can see the forest again, that the forest uh, in that sense is not uh, perceived as a natural environment, but that it becomes um, a cyborg, um, and something uh, like an autopoetic machine 
or um, a troublemaker for which, about which and for which we care. So uh, this, this caring as something troubling and something we need to heal uh, is, uh, can be really defined in this situation there. And here we see one uh, image of Marcus Meders immersive sound installation, Perimeter Fienwald, in which, for which he recorded in different places um, the, the sound of, of, uh, of places. And he also used data delivered by the uh, WSL. And um, this data he um, sonificated and they gave something like a tone or something like a voice, a very synthetic voice, which sounded from very far away, like, or which sounds, it, it's also always uh, generated in the process. This ghostly, strange voice, synthetic voice could could be something like the forest, but it's not clear what it is. We hear it, and it's um, and this um, is something <laughs> that is also very interesting that we come into this state of this uh, cyborging situation between natural forest and natural voice, ghostly voice, and synthetic voice, and uh, yeah, that we don't know exactly what it is. So, yeah, I want to stop here and to give over to Arthur. Yeah, uh, Arthur, uh, please, we would like to um, continue with uh, your presentation. Thanks a lot. I will talk about um, challenges of forest ecosystems that they face in the Anthropocene. That means that's this area, era where humans totally influence uh, Earth worldwide. And the question is really, are these ecosystems uh, at, the, at the edge and the limits of their resilience? So when, when we look now, what the safe operating space for humanity is, we see that um, there is certainly um, a problem that we do face with biodiversity loss and also with the influence of humans on the nitrogen cycle by artificial fertilizers that are used mainly in agriculture. And you see climate change, we are all talking about every day and we want certainly uh, not to heat our Earth beyond 1.5 degrees, but that's even not the most challenging thing. And that means uh, we are affecting our ecosystems, our global ecosystems, in, in ways that often are not perceived by the public. And we have, as scientists, and also I think you as the others as artists, we have to talk about that and make that more clear. I will focus on climate change and a little bit certainly also on land use, use change, which affect forest ecosystems globally. This map here shows that we have lost 50% of our forest ecosystems worldwide and many forest ecosystems also in Central Europe or in North America, they are strongly degraded. So what is left is even not functioning in a very proper and, uh, and natural way. Um, that is certainly uh, a problem that is related to many different things like intensification of agriculture, need for more agricultural and settling space for an increasing humanity, for increasing amount of humans in the world. But what we certainly do in addition, we emit such a lot of CO2 to the atmosphere that it gets warmer and warmer. And this picture here is Switzerland. And uh, there is really the change in temperature from 1864 until present, compared to a reference period, that is uh, the time from 1961 to 1990. And you definitely see that here from the left to the right, it gets reddish, 
more red, and that means temperature increases. And that means we had within the last, let's say, 60 years, we have already a temperature increase by 1.4 degrees in Switzerland. And that means, hey, it's not only the 1.5 degree goal we have to, to consider for the future. We have already started to heat at least Switzerland by 1.5 degrees. And uh, everything we add on top of that has certainly intensive consequences. But it's not only the temperature, which is getting warmer. Uh, climate pro projections also say it's getting drier. And he, we see here uh, the projected change in soil water availability, which is available for plants, for trees, for agriculture too, uh, in winter, spring, and in summer. And always when it's brown, there is less water available uh, in approximately, let's say, 65 years compared to now. And what you definitely see in summer it's getting drier. It's getting drier all over. There are only a few spots where we might have more soil moisture available, but in the Mediterranean, in Central Europe, in Germany, in Switzerland, in France, and also in, in uh, Norway and northern Sweden, it gets drier. And summer is certainly the critical period because that's a vegetation growing season. It might get a little bit wetter in winter, but that can't, be compens can't compensate the summer drought we will face further in future. And we see already the kind of first impacts of that projected increase in drought. We had 2018, 2019, 2020, we had very dry years. And here you see uh, a picture of a forest that is in northern Switzerland, close to the Rhine, close to the German border. And what you see here, they are beech trees. And that has been made in July. And the trees already in July already look like trees, beech trees normally in October. So they have premature leaf browning and the trees lost their leaf end of July, beginning of August. And that was certainly due to a uh, strongly reduced availability of water and extreme heat during that year. And that certainly continued in the following years. And you have to expect when you have uh, in, in, in a sequence of several years, comparable conditions, that will definitely strongly affect ecosystems and might lead to tree mortality, to disturbance of forests. And we see on large areas in spruce trees in Germany, for example, really die back of hectares and, and more. So the question certainly arises, what will be the future of our forest? And there is certainly a strong need for what we call a climate change field laboratory. And that's what we have set up in Fienwald. You see it here, it's in the Valais. It's the largest Scots pine forest uh, we do have in Switzerland. And Scots pine is certainly an important species. It's a coniferous species, which is spread all over Europe. And here it is already growing at the very dry edge of its area of distribution. That means it's already dry. We have already mortality, which is increasing over time because it gets hotter and drier. And what we did there, and that was what Yvonne was also saying, we added an irrigation treatment. So we have a dry forest and we wanted to re release this forest from the drought stress. So to see if it can recover, and also to see if it's mainly the natural drought, which, is causes, which causes the problems for the forest. And in future, and that's the plan, so that's not certainly not Scott's plan, that's not Fienwald, that's a roof that we have set up in a beach forest in Germany. And we want also to establish something like that in Fienwald, so that we have then uh, really a wide range of environmental conditions, the natural dry, the condition where it's really dry with the roof and a drought release treatment. So to, to figure out that a little bit and depict that with, with an easy graph, this is really our control teen wild forest. It is at the moment still in, in the range of sufficient water supply for Scots pine, but sometimes even now it crosses the border where it gets too dry and too hot for Scots pine for longer at least. And that 
will most likely be the trajectory for the future. So what we did now in 2003, we just added the irrigation treatment and doubled the amount of water that is available for the trees so that they have always sufficient water supply. We added an additional treatment because we wanted to see how a very fast change in climatic boundary conditions uh, affects the trees. So part of the irrigated trees, they were kind of pushed back to their original water supply. So that's called what we called irrigation stop. That was established uh, 10 years after the irrigation started, but certainly other trees will continue to be irrigated. And that's what we want to do from next year. We want to reduce with roots the water supply by 50%, really to push the trees by, by beyond their really uh, limit of, uh, of, of growth and, and survival ability. And we want to see the mechanisms that lead to tree mortality and also what happens, what dynamic occurs afterwards, what kind of forest de develops once the original pine is, has gone away. So that's really the kind of treatment scheme. And certainly we, we want to see not only the single trees, but also the whole forest, but don't forget the trees. So what we have done at the moment is really to apply drone-based assessments. And you can see here, these red bordered parts of the forest, they are the control that's naturally dry. The, bl the blue ones here, that is the irrigated plots and the yellowish one that are these irrigation stop treatment. The roofs are not there yet, so they will only be established next year. And what we can do with these drones, they can, they can see more than just making pictures from above, which is here. They can look at the stress level of the trees. So we can, we have sensors which really detect very narrow waveland banks bands of the reflectance of the sunlight from the canopy of these trees. And I don't want to go into detail. I just want to say, you see here, the blue trees, they are doing well. And the, the red ones, they are really stressed. And that has been, the picture has been made in July. And uh, you definitely see that are the control plots that are not irrigated. The trees are really drought stressed that are the irrigated trees, they are not stressed a lot. And here, that's the irrigation stop treatment. You see, they still benefit from the irrigation that stopped seven years, no, at that time it was six years ago, but they still benefit. So that means we now can really see how every single tree is stressed within the forest stand. And now we can also look what mechanisms do they have to compensate stress? Because when they are stressed, that's like us humans. When we are stressed, we are susceptible to diseases. And that's the same with the trees. So there are bark beetles, there are fungi, which can infect them when they are not really healthy. And the trees, they certainly have also a kind of immune system or they have defense mechanisms. And that is related to these volatile organic compounds we are talking about. And where also Kaisa will talk about her scientific work and where also Raza will go a bit more into detail. And that's certainly one of the things we are studying on these sides. However, we can be definitely sure that if climate change continues as it's projected at the moment, this forest will not look like that in 50, 70, 100 years. So that's a map of the main forest ecosystems we do have in Europe at the moment. You see here in France, we have these really large oak trees, forests dominated by these large oak trees. Here in more central Europe, we have, have these classical beech forests where beech also grew up to 30, 35 meters. And in the Mediterranean, we do have certainly drought exposed oak, other oak species like cork oak, which really look totally different in their forest structure. They are less dense because they have less water. And certainly we do have the spruce forests in the Alpine region on the one hand, and certainly in the boreal 
northern region. And when we now look what our models project, how forests look like in future, then you see that our whole France will get kind of Mediterranean type ecosystems. Spruce trees will occur only on the tops of the mountains. And in Germany, there will be not really large areas with beech anymore. So they are now the more drought tolerant oak trees which dominate. That means species will change, structures of forest will change. That has certainly economic and ecological consequences. And we have to be aware of that. Uh, and there is no chance to kind of uh, change that because it's really the global, uh, the global climate which will lead, will force the forest uh, to change and the, the trees to migrate. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Arthur, for your contribution. And now we will uh, jump directly to Raza. <laughs> Raza, the floor is yours, please. Um, yeah, continue with the presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, I will be talking about my work, which is also in critical zones um, in a show. And I will talk more about the research behind it. So in my research, I was focusing on exploring uh, this missing or invisible link, which should be there to connect uh, uh, terrestrial ecosystems with, with the aerial, like uh, forest and the atmosphere. Forest kind of a structure, yeah, which is visible material, strong. And then what about all those uh, signals, emissions out there? So. Um, that was my point of departure. And uh, yeah, so in my work, uh, and I was also, as artistic means, I wanted to use particularly like a, this virtual forest or virtual reality uh, because of a specific experience, which is when you are kind of immersed into this environment, which I wanted to bring into anywhere, you know, like forest to city exhibition space. And also I wanted to, to, to work with the data to visualize some of these processes which are happening um, in the forest. So yeah, so my work is visualizing these relations between forest and the atmosphere. Um, so the first thing when I, when I, I was really engaged in this, with the forest uh, was when I found out that forest is breathing the trees are breathing, so, and as accordingly to scientists with whom I talked, also including Arthur, they kind of surprised me when they were saying that even uh, they are releasing about CO2 back into the atmosphere, and sometimes they are, uh, even the, when the trees die, so they release all carbon, which is stored into them, actually back into the atmosphere. So how then this is possible, that why we think that they are just oxygen? producers, they, they are also much more complex systems. And the other, uh, other of course, interest was uh, into this fragrancy about these emissions of the forest, about which I knew very, very little. And uh, I wanted to go, I went to forest a couple of times. Uh, I was equipped with the LiDAR scanner, so I was, I was scanning some scenes in the forest. Uh, I was I was using a sound recorder, and indeed you need like Marcus Meader using uh, some amplifications because actually what you hear sometimes, especially in the July, is almost nothing into this forest. It's just maybe one fly over the day is flying, so there's nothing even to record. But uh, then I but then I um, yeah I was observing, I was making photos, but then one day I met Kaisa, uh, a young scientist in the forest where nobody else is present, but just this small uh, container laboratory, and she was working there. And she so enthusiastically uh, started to explain me her research about these so-called volatile emissions, how she's measuring the resin pressure into the tree, um, uh, tree trunks, tree barks, actually. And also, so what are these? So I was thinking, okay, chemicals, chemistry, air chemistry, there's something which could be quite new, interesting enough for me to explore. Uh, 
of course, these amazing machines. So all these continuous streams of, uh, of all these emissions and resin pressures that they're measured continuously. Similarly, you can see also in here in critical zone observatories uh, in an exhibition. Um, so um, then I wanted to a bit deeper understand what does it mean why the forest is so, why, it's, why it is, uh, has this pregnancy. And uh, that's also how scientists explain me. It's kind of the same molecular structure for the resin, for the colophonium, for the turpentine. So I was collecting, I was trying to, um, yeah, just to, with my hands even to understand smell. And I was collecting this resin. And then I was performing uh, like artistic experiment, uh, trying to distillate this um, resin which was hot, hot it, like cooked, and then I was pouring cold water so it became like a, I've got some drops of turpentine. And I was also kept cooking and um, I've got a colophonium sculpture with all the artifacts from this forest, including like, like needles of the pine trees. And uh, yeah, that's also a part of the exhibition here. So, and this was m like my, my engagement also with like the physicality. But then I wanted to, uh, with the virtual uh, reality forest, this immersive part and data, I wanted to, mm, I wanted to, to uh, yeah, to show actually two things, um, how they are changing. Yeah, what is this dynamics and what are these relations between the uh, atmosphere and the forest? So uh, we, we kept uh, in good conversation also with the scientists and with Kaisa, and Kaisa provided me with her data, uh, which is uh, from one growing season from six different trees. Uh, three, th three of the, these trees are growing in an um, irrigated zone which was Artu just describing, of the experimental zone. And three of them, are, uh, them were taken from, uh, from the zone, which is a control zone, which is very dry. So, um, and also resin pressure in trees. So this was like one level, so which, which, which also you can see here, visualizing. So um, and this orange was more like resin pressure and yellow level was uh, emissions. Uh, but I also was, uh, I, would, I would call it one layer. The other one layer was like you see this soil level which is green and then also coming from uh, this white like kind of a snowy or, or rainy part. These both are humidities of the, um, of the air and of uh, water potential in the soil. Yeah, so these are these connections. All together, these, um, all my, my own like imaginative uh, visualizations, yeah. So they are animated. I will show in a minute. Uh, so, so they all show actually this um, cycle how these emissions influence or uh, like uh, may affect the uh, the water and uh, and also the soil. Just it's not that clearly how you would show in the graphs maybe. And if there is this correlation, I would like to ask Kaisa, who will be talking after me, and how actually it is. So what I realized, that this is quite new research. And also the scientists uh, themselves are not yet so well um, uh, aware about the scale, how massive it may be. Maybe so how does it influence all this, cl this climate? So th these are, I think, also very challenging questions in, in an in a ecosystem and climate science. Uh, and um, still I like this uh, thesis that this climate change, uh, yeah, it's kind of leading us, as you've heard from Arthur, so it's no way to escape. It will become more dry. It will become more dry, as you saw from these scientific visualizations, uh, the trees will be in over more stress. Uh, and this stress might give us more, maybe more fragrant forests. So that's uh, kind of like is this, also a thesis a little bit behind my work. So this is what you can see here. And now I would like to show the video. And I will comment a little bit. There is one more structure, which I didn't mention. Uh, so the forest itself, 
uh, which was scanned uh, in the point cloud. So it also has, is uh, covered with the layers of data, of the same data during one growing season. Just these are uh, temperature data. So, and, and it, it gives an impression of day and night change because of course in the night time, uh, that's why it's changing to dark, to day. And, and also sometimes it goes into very red when it's above plus 30. So then this forest becomes red. And then these visualizations, what you see, is, yeah, uh, these are like uh, some chosen trees also in a specific this area where the data were coming from. So it's like a dynamics of this uh, emitted particles, yeah, to put, to put embedded into the structure of this particular forest. together is about 17 minutes so if there's a chance just to sit down and immerse then, uh, then there are five different seats. This is more like showing because there is also a river painted next to this forest so this shows more like these relations between the cloud, yeah, clouds because all these emissions also influence cloud uh, creation. Uh, so it's very quickly, it just takes a minute. Uh, and hours and uh, all these emissions are turned into aerosols and then uh, they are yeah, responsible for cloud creation. And so the work is also in virtual reality so where you can really experience it where you can move yourself through the forest and you are also taken by our uh, kind of moment because uh, we wanted also uh, that viewer goes through the tree trunk from the bottom up, like looking for you know, a whole forest ecosystem from the bottom and then it goes far above up. You know, so kind of from the angles which you usually don't see. And then the, this one scene is uh, just the, the visualization, so there is even no forest behind it. So it's just an emitted structure completely like imaginative so from all these data which uh, are yeah, provided by guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Raza, for uh, showing also the insights in your uh, work. I just would like to mention also that uh, the work uh, was chosen as the finalist for the uh, Falling uh, Walls Science uh, Breakthroughs, um, the uh, international science platform in Berlin recently. Uh, congratulations also on this. <laughs> And um, then uh, we would like to um, switch to Kaiser um, <coughs> and uh, to, to follow her presentation. Kaiser, you're very welcome. The floor is yours. Um, hey. I'll just figure out to share my screen. You should see it now? No? Uh, not yet. It's sharing. Okay, I suppose it takes Good. a little moment. Okay. And um, yes, thank you for, for the invitation to come here and for the nice introduction and uh, raise something in the chat. Yes. Um, I was asked to, uh, to give some more scientific background or uh, background from the tree perspective about these volatile emissions and to go a bit through um, my research in the Finval that led to meeting Rasa and this beautiful 
artwork that I'm still in awe of. And uh, for this part, I would like to start by kind of going back to the forest, maybe the, the virtual forest we were in just now, or the forest we were walking in last weekend, and um, and to remind ourselves of the smells of the forest, like how did the the leaves of the trees smell like, or what kind of odors came from the forest floor. And now I'm going to give you the chemical structure of those smells. They look a bit boring when you put it like that, but um, the smells that we get in the forest, they are called volatile organic compounds or uh, biogenic volatile organic compounds, if we want to make sure that we talk about uh, compounds that come from vegetation rather than human sources. And they can be, for example, uh, like this. So we could have isoprene or carine or different kind of pineys that come especially from this kind of pine forest. But what exactly these compounds are and how much they are emitted depends a lot from the vegetation, so it's kind of plant we have, and also from the environmental conditions, as Raza was showing. So it depends on the temperature and the humidity conditions. So why this is especially interesting or important for the tree, and why is it so interesting for us scientists to look into? And uh, here I'd like to point out three main reasons. There are, of course, many more, but these are the ones that maybe uh, speak to me the most. So the first, as Arthur was already showing, is that they are important for the tree defense. These compounds help the trees to avoid and endure stresses, such as too much heat or too much sunlight, or then infestations by nasty beetles or different fungi. Kind of related to that is that these compounds are also used in signaling. So between different plants or between plants and the insects. So let's say that the, the big pine in the middle is attacked by the nasty beetle here. Uh, the trees that are close by can sense the signals that come from the attack tree and already prepare themselves to a possible invasion by, by a beetle. And the third point, uh, which is what I'm going to go more into in this presentation, is the effects in the atmospheric chemistry. So uh, atmospheric chemistry and the carbon balance. So these compounds, as they are made of carbon, they have certain effect on the on the tree or in the ecosystem scale carbon balance. Um, but also they have really interesting and important roles in the chemistry in the atmosphere once they are emitted out from the trees. So first, to give some scale about the effects on the carbon balance. So let's say we are here in the Finval forest and we have carbon that is fixed by photosynthesis into the trees. Part of that is used for respiration like we do. So they breathe, part of this is used for growth. But there is a certain part that is also lost with these emissions of VOCs, of the volatile compounds. And that is, as Rasa said, still uh, answer numbers. But what I found with the quick research was from less than 1% to about 5% of the carbon that is fixed can be released as VOCs. And, uh, this number will be lower if the species in the forest are not high emitters of VOCs and if the forest is not stressed. But if we have, for example, pine forest that is already a, a moderate emissions of VOCs and then the forest is stressed, the number will be higher. And as to the roles of, of these compounds in the atmosphere, and in the climate change, as, as Rasa was saying, they are kind of seeds for clouds. So once emitted to atmosphere, these VOC compounds can react with other gases in the atmosphere and the reaction um, products will start to participate in the growth of big particles that we can call atmospheric particles or aerosols. And when these particles are big enough, 
then we can start to have a condensation of water around them, which leads into formation of clouds. Now, uh, clouds and the aerosols are nice in the sense that they can block and reflect some part of the solar radiation, which means that they have a, a small cooling effect on our climate, as we can all sense when it's a hot day and then if there's a cloud that passes, it's, it's much more tolerable. But it's also important in the grand scheme of things of, of the heating climate and the, and the change in chemistry of the of atmosphere. Meaning that um, I'm not going to go too much into detail of this uh, slightly scary graph, but if we have increase in the air temperature due to climate change, we have increased emissions of these VOC compounds. And uh, increased emissions of VOC compounds can mean that we have more clouds and more reflective clouds that in turn can reduce the air temperature to a certain extent. And now I just want to say that while this effect is important and it's important to understand in the point of view of modeling our future climate and understanding how the climate is going to change, um, the effect is still small in comparison to the actual human impact on climate. So this is not going to uh, um, save the situation, but it's a part that we need to understand. And uh, lastly, in this part, uh, just want to note that although now we speak of these emissions in a positive, as a positive thing, because of course, from the point of view of tree, they are important and they can help us to moderate the climate change. Um, as everything in biology also has kind of the negative side. So uh, if we have these compounds, lots and lots near areas which are polluted already due to traffic, or due to industry, um, they can react in the atmosphere so that they create, for example, ozone, which near the ground level is uh, harmful both for humans and for the vegetation. So uh, no question is, is simple and clear cut, and uh, we need to understand also this part of the VOC uh, effects in the atmosphere. Now to uh, going more into uh, the details of my study and uh, what the motivations for me going to Finval is that uh, to better understand the, the atmospheric chemistry and the future climate, we need to understand where do these VOC compounds come from. Uh, so which kind of environments are important in in emitting VOCs and which parts of a certain environment or a certain ecosystem are emitting them. And uh, until now we have studied a lot of the green parts of trees, for example. So we know quite a bit about the emissions from shoots of trees because they are more active and of course they usually contribute more to the emissions. But until now one missing piece has been uh, the stems of the trees. And now, especially trees like pines or spruces that can store large amount of resin inside them. And as Raza said, uh, part of that resin is actually also part of these VOC emissions. So uh, I packed my gear and uh, put them in a, on a pallet and sent them to, to Finval Forest and then started setting up this crazy system of tubes and uh, cables and uh, small machines and big machines to be able to finally measure with these um, plastic chambers what gases are coming out from the tree stem and feed them into my gas analyzer, which we can think as a, as a machine knows. So it's it's not walking around the forest and smelling things, but I'm feeding it stuff and it's smelling what is happening inside. And with that, we were able to visualize, or the computer was visualizing, um, all the different compounds that were coming out from the tree stem with different color uh, when I was closing the chamber. And this is, this is how the raw data looked like before it was sent to 
of the rasa, for example, for her, her visualization. And now, actually, just at the moment, we are hoping to get the final report, the final paper of the study done and out in public. And the main result that's beautifully illustrated in Russell's work is that actually these three stems are big sources of VOCs and especially ones called monoterpenes. And uh, it's encouraging to do more research in the different parts of the ecosystems and not only from the green parts. So thank you from my part. I will stop share now. Yes. Thank you, Kaiser, for this uh, interesting insight into uh, volatile organic compounds. And um, uh, now Yvonne will also um, finish the part with the contributions, and then we will start into the discussion. Yvonne, please. OK. Um, can you see? The, yeah, thank you. The WSL provided RASA with technologies such as the LIDAR scanner. They also provided her with data in form of uh, these graphs and numbers which we saw and which uh, Raza and her team transformed into these um, animations. In the video installation, um, we see the trees like chimneys they throw thousands of brightly shining particles into the black of the environment. They connect, they dance. The trees are machines, organisms, crazed constellations, breathing beings that are frighteningly alive. We experience them as alien things that we no longer understand. Um, the VR installation and the animation enables the viewer not only to watch the usually invisible VOCs emitting, but rather we are entering and participating in the scene. We are going into the forest. We experience it from the inside. The forest, the environment, the oikos is an inside but not in the sense of a domestic home, of ein heimliches, schönes Heim, but rather as something completely alienated and uncanny, as something, the forest, going wild. And we do not only observe this, we become part of this. Rasa Smith's aesthetic strategy is the appropriation of the technological and physical. She went with the LiDAR scanner into the forest to scan individual trees. Scientists do this as well, but this technology is increasingly used to take large area pictures from a distance, for example with the drones. As a result, Scientists no longer, no longer have to go on location. Raza tries to overcome such distances through performative actions. You see it here. Thus, she works directly with the emissions of the trees, collects the resin, boils it in a clearing on a fireplace, until it becomes liquid and volatile, and molecular parts of it disappear into the atmosphere. Watching Raza perform this artisanal um, activity reminds one of a witch, or a drug cook, or a housewife. Her transformative knowledge appears ancient and future, alien and everyday-like at the same time. Um, yeah, um, ecological art, the art of the Oikos Logos, is about terrestrial transformation, about becoming, about the joy of becoming. It is a surplus, an excess, 
about the experience to be part of an evolving world in becoming, of a world which is at the same time intimate and close, as well as atmospheric and terrestrial, because this is what we exactly experience in her um, installation, that the environment is something, um, is an inside but an outside at the same time. What we might experience in this VR installation is also a strange way of joy stemming from the situation that those beautiful images of which we became part of are effects of climate heating and destruction. We become part of an impossible situation, of an apparatic situation. We cannot solve this situation as we cannot solve the problem of climate heating at the moment. But such an installation allows us to face or to confront this uh, barbarism in the eyes. Quotation from Isabel Stengers, who speaks of this barbarism of the Anthropocene. She says, joy is the production or discovery of a new degree of freedom. And she, said, she continues, joy also has an epidemic potential. In this sense, atmospheric forest, as well as perimeter Pfienwald, can be experienced as a celebration of care, a celebration of the refusal to let ourselves be intimidated by panic and fear of the barbarism of the Anthropocene. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Yvonne, for um, somehow, yeah, um, summing up also in philosophical sense the, the presentation of uh, Raza. And uh, I think um, we can now also start into uh, our discussion. Um, also, the uh, audience is uh, very much uh, invited to participate. Uh, so I would like to uh, remind the Telegram group uh, who is online that uh, we can also bring in the questions. Um, I will just uh, start probably with a very um, general question uh, about also how how you approached each, uh, each other in this project and uh, I think there is like a consensus or um, common ground um, about the technology like the LiDAR scanner is the device which is uh, used uh, by Raza and uh, which he borrowed from uh, the scientist but I think that also innovation uh, or like uh, also something new comes also from uh, clash or like from uh, uh, not common things but also from uh, tension and uh, I would very much to know how you you really collaborated with uh, each other and uh, how you approached each other in this project? What, how, how like art uh, approached science or like vice versa? Uh, and uh, probably you could a bit elaborate on uh, this point. Okay. Raza, you would like, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, well, very carefully, of course, because um, when you work with scientists, you always think they know much more than you do, <laughs> well, that's, which is true because they study this topic in particular. Um, and then um, I have my idea how I would like to this um, artwork look like. And then um, I, I, what, I, what I did, I was trying um, actually to, to, to establish the feedback. I went quite often, let's say a couple of times at least, also to this uh, VSL Institute to, to, to show in different stages this work, just also to be sure that it, it can look like this <laughs> because, uh, because we don't know, of course. It's like visualizations of, I don't know, electromagnetic or, you know, like, or any other, you know, cosmic. So you can hear something like, um, but uh, yeah, like different, like uh, and Sonify, and uh, so far so good. But but visualize, then it's a bit you know like your imagination. <laughs> yeah, and of course, um, particularly what I like, uh, I was like I liked also that I immediately had this idea that if if I will scan with the lidar, I will I want to put it into the game engine, and not in just to make a beautiful 3D, but to use kind of this potentiality of game, but it never goes into game. 
you know? So it's kind of the environment which potentially could become, but at the same time, it's more for exploration, yeah. And uh, yeah, I would be very curious actually what Kaisa and Arthur is thinking about it. Yeah, Kaisa, probably you could also join in and uh, also uh, share your thoughts and what you feel when you see also this artwork, when you see the visualization of the invisible particles that you're basically studying. Uh, like, how, um, how do you feel? <laughs> yes, well, for me, uh, as Rasa was actually describing very well in the beginning, the collaboration started as like a a happy surprise that there was somebody in the forest suddenly and where I was working and interested in what I'm doing and I think I had been working on my own for quite some time so I was just like giving all the information that I had at the moment and, and explaining my process and that's where it started from and I had no idea what was going to happen with the data but I was happy it was being used and then when I finally see the first versions of the of the forest, it was just so beautiful to me, and uh, the way that we can illustrate something that's, well, yeah, as humans, we can smell the VOCs, but our sense is never that important as our eyes, at least for me. So it was really nice to see this um, as a visualized thing, and kind of as Arthur said before in our initial discussions, is that we, as a scientist, we we try to visualize our data, but it comes with different kind of constraints and it needs to be significant and whatever, whatever. So it was really refreshing to see it from the point of view of, of art and aesthetics. So uh, I find that this is a, a pretty valuable way of, of connecting with the larger audience, with the data we have and kind of try to offer it. Okay, uh, thank you, Kaiser and Arthur. Probably also you could share your experience, like how how you approached each other, and also uh, what uh, what can science basically uh, also learn from from art from artistic visualization? Because um, science works a lot also with uh, different kind of visualizations. But what is so special about uh, um, collaborating with the artists? I think. I think we scientists, we, we, ha we always love a, a strong level of abstraction. So when I showed, for example, this drone image of the different stress levels of the trees, and that is certainly a first product. But in the end, we have to press everything into bar graphs and add a statistics on that. And that is really not that much tangible for somebody who is not used to kind of see this kind of data visualization. And I think th the possibility to walk through a forest and really to see directly the emissions of the VOC is that, that touches other senses than uh, a scientific bar graph in a very, I would say, dry scientific paper. Um, and so I feel we can reach other people, more people, different uh, people with different interests with uh, our message. And I think the message is always embedded into a larger picture. And I think that's what we have been seeing here with what Kaiser has been saying. The VOCs, they are not, they are, they are certainly, they, are, they make the smell of the forest, um, but they are much more. They have different functions. And uh, if you, start to kind of dive into a forest virtually and you you walk through the point clouds of the lighter scan and you see the kind of VOCs emitted from the trees, that can be a starting point then to to be interested in what does it make on the larger scale. And I think uh, that is that is a kind of raising of awareness which scientists often try to do, but they are not always successful, I would say, with that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for this, uh, uh, yeah, for this answer. Um, I would like to uh, also to uh, ask probably there are questions from the audience uh, here in the media theater. You are also very welcome to to ask and to uh, get in dialogue with uh, participants. Uh, 
if there, uh, there are uh, not yet questions, I probably will ask um, one um, myself. Um, I would, um, like in the Critical Zones exhibition, uh, we have um, also this uh, idea of observation, which is very, very important and uh, through which we also try to, yeah, to probably to um, say that uh, we need to develop a new and sensitive, more sensitive um, attitudes towards the world we are living in and uh, towards interactions between different entities, uh, humans and non-humans in this world. And uh, Yvonne, you have been uh, so uh, much speaking about care and uh, observation or observare uh, in Latin mean, uh, means also to esteem and to care for something, one of the meanings. Uh, probably could you elaborate a bit like uh, what is for you also this connection between care and observation uh, and probably care and surveillance because we have seen also so many sensors in the forest and uh, it's uh, also interesting aspects that is basically also a border to control or to surveillance of the uh, above the uh, this ecosystem thank you yeah in a certain sense it's also a problematic term this observation because it comes from a distant view uh, in which uh, um, a subject is outside of the scene and, and uh, scrutinizes the other object. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, in that sense observation is very, very problematic because it, um, it installs this distance. And this is also why I find uh, an aesthetic approach so important because I think that, um, that it can bring more to the fore this, this care, I care also <laughs> and, and I am affected by, uh, by uh, the entity I care for. This affection I think becomes more a point and I found it interesting that uh, Arthur was also, um, yes, underscoring this um, this point that in the observation you don't have the direct effect and this idea. But I I did not know that observare is uh, is related to cura curare. I didn't know that, so I'm really, yeah. <laughs> Astonished, but I think in a certain sense it suits me because I am from an aesthetic point of view, I'm very much interested in this contradictory apoetic or uh, um, situations which, which aesthetics, art can do that. They do not need to solve something. Yeah, probably also in the sense of uh, observation, it's uh, interesting or to bring this connection, it's also interesting to think about uh, Anna Tsing and her um, ideas of uh, arts of noticing and of uh, yeah, carefully like um, observing uh, in this sense. Probably there might be connection via like uh, we just need to change our relationship to these uh, things around. Probably sometimes we even don't notice what is around us, what we depend on, and um, yeah, what um, what is important for for uh, thriving of uh, humans and non-humans. And probably this aspect of observation can go into this uh, field. How we can yeah became become more sensitive probably towards uh, different entities we had a workshop and in that anna krisnova Chris, i cannot say <laughs> krisnovaiska uh, from sheffield she was um, she was referring to a term of isabel stengers who speaks of apparatus of attention and in a certain sense i prefer that terminology to the observation uh, because yeah because it's it's more it it uh, has more this um, effective uh, signification than observation, which is still, as I said before, more this distant, which has more this distant association. Yeah. Um, okay. And um, probably there are now some, some questions. Yeah. Remarks. Yeah, Arthur, you're welcome, please. 
Yeah, I, I would I would like to add to that because I think in science, in natural science, we definitely need the distance because we are really looking for mechanisms for processes where we have to keep first the distance. Otherwise, uh, it it would be too subjective. And I think uh, that I think that that that's maybe the difference between art and science and too much affection is maybe not always good because that might bias uh, what we want to or what we find out in the end. However, I think it is important to to see these two different sides and possibilities to approach, for example, forest ecosystems or or many different objects. And um, I think we have to make clear that uh, we have different ways to approach that the scientific way is a different one from the arts way, but that there is a way to, to bring these things, these things together and to have a complementarity of that. And I think that, that I think that's important that, that we notice and uh, be aware of that. Yeah, thank you, Arthur. Yeah, that's um, uh, interesting also, uh, yeah, insights. And uh, be because, um, um, yeah, these scientific and artistic uh, methodologies, they have, of course, also different uh, bases, and uh, science is uh, more directed towards uh, epistemic norms of uh, knowledge, knowledge productions, and uh, artists are, of course, more free into uh, interpreting and also in uh, being free in uh, interpretation of uh, things, also being speculative um, in some way. Um, yeah, but uh, I also wanted just to remark that uh, I find it so significant also that uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, scientific research uh, about the uh, cycles and uh, uh, biogeochemical processes um, happening in the forest ecosystems but uh, and also the um, uh, artistic works, that they uh, basically um, teach us that um, nature is not something static or is not staged for our acts, but uh, it's a complex system that is not only mm. um, having a carbon sink uh, function, for example, but also uh, breathing and uh, changing, and there are different, many uh, yeah, dynamic uh, processes uh, happening uh, over there, which uh, we don't notice with a naked eye, but uh, which can uh, be sensed and... Um, uh, yeah, visualized uh, through through uh, different uh, artistic and scientific techniques. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, great. If you you can also use the mic, or you can uh, just uh, ask something, and uh, I will um, uh, put it loud. <laughs> What? Because the, the last sentence I did not understand. Yeah, probably we can uh, also uh, say it loud uh, so that uh, the uh, public audience uh, in the live stream also uh, get, because uh, without mic it's about uh, complicated, and also for Arthur and for Kaiser. Um, so um, there is a question about the uh, uh, water canal, as I understood, uh, close to the Finwald uh, forest that is basically directed by humans and not leading anymore through the forest. And um, uh, this um, uh, was very astonishing uh, to see uh, also in, uh, in the framework of what um, uh, Yvonne was speaking about, this uh, human barbarism, uh, how humans also change uh, the ecosystems and what would have happened if the uh, river had stayed in its natural uh, flow and um, uh, so to went directly through, through the forest.
Yeah, probably you can, uh, Otto, if you can also show the picture, the aerial view of uh, the Finwald forest uh, from above, probably we can better see uh, the, you know, the situation over there. Yeah, there is a river just next yes. to it. I, I have shared it. I have shared it now. Exactly. So maybe I, I can say something to that. So that's a water, that's a really a channel uh, with a concrete riverbed. And so there is no contact uh, between this channel and the surrounding groundwater table or soil. And that's directed to a hydropower plant. However, if there were no channel, there would be no water streaming through the forest because that water is obtained from the River Rhone. And the riverbed of the River Rhone is uh, approximately uh, 100 meters away and approximately 5 to 10 meters down slope. So that means it, it has not been really separated from the forest, but it has been just added close to the forest. However, with not affecting the forest. The forest is mainly affected by ground, uh, by not by groundwater, groundwater table is very low. It's maybe 10 meters below, just like the riverbed of the River Rhone. Uh, mainly affected by rainwater and a little bit by so-called lateral flow because we have, a, we have a bit of a slope within the forest, which is not visible from uh, that overhead photo. Um, so that really from the mountains, uh, on the right side, that would be so that's on the south, there is uh, some water kind of flowing along the slope and there might also be some influence. Okay, thank you for clarification. Um, yeah, we, yeah, okay, <laughs> great. Um, so, uh, can I have a question if I, if Arthur and Kaiser are here? Because I wonder a little bit what this, what this research shows us with the VOCs, with the, with the Scots pine emitting VOCs, uh, um, and becoming something, yes, like a little bit, um, deadly, uh, deadly weapons. Um, of which we do not know exactly what they are. So my question is a little bit, how do you interpret this? Uh, what, um, because usually for, the, for people, uh, trees, are, we need to plant trees to compensate, for example, for flying or something like that. We have been talking, I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. It's strange because you cannot compensate what uh, what a, a plane emitted. But with respect to to these trees, what can we say? What is happening? Is this something dangerous? Well, I can say that um, the important. Hard. If we talk about, for example, about planting new trees to compensate for the climate change, um, what we need to take into account is where these trees are planted and which species are planted. So uh, if we just plant trees without any consideration, yes, there is a possibility that we have, for example, high emitting eucalyptus trees near, let's say, uh, large roads that have high emissions of a specific pollutant that is like nitrous oxides that can react with these VOCs and cause ozone concentrations on the ground level to increase. But um, outside of these specific uh, problematic combinations of a certain tree species that has high emissions and a certain location that is already polluted, um, the negative effects of these VOC emissions are, according to current understanding, outcompeted by the by the positive effects of the of the growth of the trees, so the stocking of carbon, and by the also the the positive effects of the VOC emissions. So, if we talk about planting trees in more rural areas, for example, where they have been harvested, and uh, 
certain tree species to uh, add more green to the cities. I'd say that's that's still okay, and we don't need to be uh, afraid of them poisoning us. I might I might add to that because uh, I think Kaisa showed that really in a nice way that uh, trees or forests are kind of architects of their own climate. So if it gets too hot, they start to emit more VOCs. Then with this VOC emission and some other processes, they produce clouds, which are shading, and then the temperature goes down. And it's, it's just the humans which, which kind of interfere. And if you plant forests and they emit high VOC, uh, they have high VOC emissions, it's just the, the uh, nitrogen oxide emissions from traffic or from uh, fossil fuel combustions in, in power plants, which interfere with that. So there is a natural kind of regulation that uh, forests are able to perform. And the, the main problem is that uh, our human actions, they, they interfere with this, natural, with this natural cycle. And only then we have some, some kind of dangerous side effects like ozone production or other uh, oxidative organic compounds in the atmosphere, which are then certainly negatively affecting humans, human lungs, and uh, also again, forest trees. But it's again, this kind of non-sustainable behavior of humans, I would say, which is in principle dangerous in the end. Okay, uh, we have a question from a YouTube uh, that I would like to bring in. Like icebergs, much a tree is not visible. Its roots underground. How do we study those? And probably to expand this question, I would like also to ask um, what percentage of what we don't really know about trees uh, in relationship to what we know, like uh, is there still much to to experience my, uh, like also volatile particles, there are so many questions about it, how it affects climate, how uh, the processes are taking place, like um, are there still things to, to we, that we can uh, yet discover about, about these ecosystems and trees? Probably it's to uh, say the scientific part of the discussion to Arto and to <laughs> Kais. <laughs> Maybe I can start and then uh, hand over to Kaiser. I think certainly it's very difficult to say what do we know, what, what do, don't we know. I think there are so many things we don't know and we even do not know what we don't know. So that's the uh, uh, unknown unknown and therefore it's very difficult to, to kind of make uh, balances or projections. Um, when it comes really down to mo molecular regulation, but also to kind of global cycles, there's really a lot we don't know. Our Earth system models, they don't represent uh, the kind of feedback of the biosphere to the atmosphere in a very, very good way. So that are all rough estimates that we do have. So there is a lot we don't know. Um, and when we look to the dark side or hidden half of the ecosystem, certainly the below ground part is even more difficult to assess. And roots also emit VOCs, we do know that, but it's much more difficult to quantify. And there are so many interactions between roots of plants or trees and forest ecosystems, fungi, root, almost all trees are uh, associated with um, symbiotic mycorrhizal fungi, and also the soil microbes. And they all, it's, it's really a jungle down there, and they all interact with each other. One gets carbon from the, the microbes get carbon from the trees, the trees get nutrients from the microbes. Um, there is a kind of trade, like a, like a stock exchange market. There's a lot of cheating. It's very human down there, and but it's many things are we know we get to know things better, but many things are really not discovered. Kaisa, I think you have more examples. Yeah, I I totally agree that there's so much that we don't know we don't know, and 
for that, I think it's super important that the research on some level can stay curiosity driven so that the work that is done is not only um, so that it's not only like one single pathway and one single question, but we let ourselves to deviate and find new questions where they pop up, because that might be the important part that we haven't yet considered. And in that, um, I found it actually super interesting to talk with Raza and usually people who are slightly outside of the field of research that we are in, because the questions that that can sometimes just pop up in discussions like that are are amazing. It's like, oh, okay, I, I never considered that. And that might be actually interesting and that might be important and maybe we should look into that. So through these collaborations, we can um, try to shed light in the, in the questions that we haven't yet asked. Um, but yet to quantify about the VOC emissions, we, uh, as an example, we have two ways of trying to understand how much VOCs are emitted from certain kind of forest ecosystem. So we can do kind of like I did, that I put chambers around the part of the tree that I want to measure. And then I start to calculate like, okay, I cover this much and there is this much of stem. So this tree would be emitting in total sum of that much of, let's say, monoterpenes. And the other option is then to put on a tall tower. And on top of that tower, uh, draw the air and you um, do fancy calculations of how the air is moving on top of the canopy and from that calculate how much the ecosystem in total should be emitting the VOCs. And uh, more often than not we find that the two kind of estimates, so from the top of the forest and from each little part of the forest, they just don't match. So. <laughs> It's frustrating, but it's also it's also good for us because there's still work to do and we are not yet making ourselves useless. So we need to continue and search for the missing sources, but we call them they are missing sources of VOCs in the ecosystem. So we have to look into more detail, like where the variation comes from, where where uh, there are sources that we haven't yet considered, for example, the soil. Is, is interesting and it's up and coming. And um, that is just to say that in the VOC world, as in almost all fields of science, there is, is still a lot to uncover. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I think that's uh, also an interesting point um, for, yeah, for finalizing our last session of the terrestrial university that there are still a lot of questions that um, we can engage with in uh, artistic, uh, artistic and scientific ways. And um, if there are no uh, questions anymore, uh, I would say that um, uh, yeah, we need to come to an end. And uh, uh, it was the last uh, edition of the Terrestrial University. And thank you very much for following our program online. And uh, today also is uh, last final edition here in, in the Media Theatre. But um, the exhibition runs still uh, till the uh, 9th of January. And uh, we will continue, of course, with um, different uh, further formats. And uh, we thought that it would be nice to propose uh, to you to offer to you a reading class. Uh, starting from October, this would be our new format, and uh, please stay, stay tuned and um, follow uh, our program on online and uh, also hopefully uh, here um, in hybrid formats um, at ZKM. So I would like also to thank uh, all of uh, our uh, team, uh, also of course guests uh, and the public uh, for being with us. Um, yeah, the uh, video studio and the event department for uh, this uh, hybrid setting that uh, also was quite a challenge, uh, I think, for, for uh, all of us, but it's, uh, I think it worked very well out. And um, uh, thank you so much for staying with us and uh, we, See you, see each other uh, in October in the Reading Club. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you.